Hey guys, my name is Ethan, this is Cobra, and welcome to the video where I teach you the basics of async. So async is a rather complicated and misunderstood part of Python, and it's actually a part of a lot of programming languages as well. But Python actually has it hard baked into the syntax itself to make it easier to use. So it aims to reduce the amount of time that the CPU is just waiting for new tasks because another one isn't finished or it's waiting for a specific condition to be met and stuff like that. It's actually really useful to know and even if you're not building async libraries from the ground up, a lot of async libraries sort of require a decent amount of knowledge of at least how it works. And this video should allow you to use those libraries more confidently with more knowledge about what's going on under the hood. I should also point out that just because you've written an application using async, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get the benefits from it. You need to program it in a specific way and I'm gonna be talking about that a little bit later as well. Of course, if you find the video helpful at any point, then consider like it to let me know and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos in the series. But yeah, with that, I've created a little visualization to help explain the concept better. So I'm going to shift over to VoiceOver Me to run you through it. Before I explain async, I want to quickly go over the basics of parallel processing for comparison's sakes. So in this example, there are two cores and four tasks, none of which are dependent on any other. Each core can do one thing at once, so each core can be given a task to be getting along with. Once one core is done with a task, it can move on to the next one and so on and so forth until all four tasks are complete. Async is different in the sense that only one core is involved. It doesn't aim to make use of more cores, but instead aims to make better use of a single core. Let me explain. In this example, we again have four tasks. However, tasks one and four are not dependent on any other task. Task three can only run after task two has been completed, and task two can only run once per minute. Task one runs as normal until completion. However, if we were running these tasks in sequential order, we would be forced to wait until task 2 can run before any other task can run, even though task 4 isn't dependent on task 2 at all. With a little bit of extra programming, we can send task 4 up to the CPU to get its teeth stuck into. However, we don't have to wait until task 4 is done before giving task 2 some showtime. In coroutines, what all asynchronous functions are called in Python, CPU time can be given to other tasks mid-execution, and then tasks can continue where they left off later. So in the instance that task 4 is quite long and overruns into when task 2 is scheduled to run, task 4 can pass off to task 2 for a bit, and the two can even continue swapping. Eventually task 4 will be completed, and task 2, and then subsequently task 3, can be completed as normal. So now we've gotten through all that explanation, I can actually kind of show you what I mean in practical code. So the first thing we need to do is import async um, IO. Now it's called async IO, I've been calling it async EO for a long time. I might refer to it as async EO during this video, if I do I'm sorry, it's just I've been doing it for so long I'm so used to it, it's difficult to break out of. But the point is that this library is essentially how you run um, async tasks. So even though the syntax is baked into uh, the Python library, you do not actually need to import this library to kind of run tasks, run loops, etc, etc. And we're going to start with a very simple example. We're going to start with our main here. And we're going to print hello. Uh, and then we're going to do ace uh, or wait. Uh, and then uh, asynco has a sleep function. And we're going to sleep for one second. Um, so that does essentially the same as time sleep uh, or time.sleep, but it allows other work to you know happen while it is sleeping. Um, we won't be showing it off in this example, we will, uh, but we will be showing it off in others. Uh, I just kind of want to show how to actually run these things first. So we can have our asyncho.run uh, and then we pass in main. Now we pass in and then we actually call the function because the function itself returns a coroutine and I'll show that in more detail uh, a little bit down the line but if you just run this we'll see it says hello world. It waits a second before printing the world um, and you kind of get the idea. So we ran our first um, asynchronous function, E. But now I want to show you what happens behind the scenes and why specifically uh, you get an error if you just do this. Because as you can see you get the runtime, coroutine main was never awaited, enable trace malloc to get the option object allocation trace back, um, which is a really odd error. I don't necessarily know why it says that. Um, but essentially if you get that, that pretty much means that you haven't run anything asynchronously. So to do that, we're actually going to create a new um, function here. We're going to call it add, and we're going to return x plus y. So this is going to add two numbers together. And we're going to do r equals add 5, 6. And then we're going to print r. And you'll notice that it doesn't print the actual um, 
uh, it doesn't print the result. It instead, prints this coroutine object add at and then the memory address in which it's currently stored. And that's because when uh, a function definition is prefixed with async, it returns a coroutine object when called and not the actual result itself. And this coroutine object is also called a future in some instances. I believe in some other languages like JS, it's called a promise. But the the actual premise is exactly the same. So to actually, you know, uh, run our uh, function, we do uh, result equals await r, and then we, if we do print result, we actually have the result in place now. So we, uh, we're we still printing the coroutine object, but now we're actually awaiting it. So this is kind of running our coroutine, and then we get the result, which is 11. Uh, more often than not, you won't see it all like that. You'll just see await add five, or uh, we use different numbers to show that it's different. Wait, seven and eight. Uh, so as you can see, it prints 15. This is just kind of a, a shortcut. And the way this happens allows for this syntax to kind of be a thing where you still kind of run the function quote as normal. You just need to add a wait and everything else is done automatically for you. So that is the basics of how to run async here. But now I want to show you a few examples um, <clears throat> of how async can appear to you know be a uh, sort of parallel processing it's it sort of like mimics it in a weird way but really all it's doing is just kind of allowing another task to take uh, or to do its work and then returning to the first one um so i'm not going to type all these out for time constraints but we do have kind of these examples already here so what this one's doing is it's importing async o it's importing time we create this count variable and then we have this counter. Now I have committed the cardinal sin of using a global variable. It's just easy to demonstrate, don't at me. But essentially what this counter does is while true, it counts um, to one. And we are actually going to remove that line for now because I want to show you something. Um, so all this is going to do is in uh, increase the counter by one as fast as it physically can. And then we have this uh, monitor here, which while true, it prints the time in which the message is printed and it prints the count at that particular time and then waits a single second. <clears throat> so to, uh, to make these things run, we can create a loop using async.getEventLoop. This just gets an event loop. I'm pretty sure the loop is just an event loop object. It just creates one. You don't need to do anything in the background with that. And then you can create these tasks. So task one, um, we have our counter. Now we are calling this to get the coroutine object specifically the coroutine object. If you do this, it's not going to work. You need to make sure you actually get the coroutine. And then you can create a task and this returns a task object. And then the same with the monitor one as well. And then you can do loop.run forever. Uh, this will just run the loop for, well, forever until the user manually stops it. This isn't how most loops are done, but in this particular instance, it works for us. <clears throat> so if we run this now, async2, we'll see that nothing is actually printed. And this is what I was saying before about how async doesn't like guarantee um, that you know multiple things will work. Just because you've created a loop and created tasks and you've made all these asynchronous, it doesn't mean that you know the monitor is ever going to be run because this while true is ultimately still blocking and you are never passing the work uh, or you're never giving another task an opportunity to execute. What you can do is use this asyncure.sleep zero. And while this doesn't actually do any sleeping in terms of time, it does pass um, the CPU over to a different task to be able to execute what it wants to do. So essentially this is, is sort of like an uh, async, uh, bleh, async IO, there we go, dot pass CPU to another task, allow it to do its work and then come back. In, in short, this sort of works a lot like generators really, where the execution point just gets uh, reset back to this and then it kind of continues the while loop as it is. But now that we're actually passing um, uh, or giving the monitor task an opportunity to actually do something, we can see that these things are actually printed. So it counts, as you say, it counts to one and then it, it immediately passes it off to something else. So the monitor prints instantly and then the monitor allows for one second of operation. So this will sleep for a second and this counter will just count up as fast as it can for a second. This asyncure.sleep is still called, however, because there are, are no other tasks that need to execute, it just ignores it and continues going. 
as you can see, this is how you have a timed thing. So it's not like you're doing a modulus of a thousand and printing every thousand or whatever. You're actually printing every second. It is like two things are happening at the same time. And that is in theory because they kind of are. But what's really happening is that one is just kind of constantly every second just taking uh, the task uh, or taking the priority of the CPU and then once that's done, it goes, okay, the counter can have this back for as long as it wants it now. So this is kind of an example of how AsyncQ kind of works in the background, but this is not necessarily how you would ever really do anything. Uh, the run forever, while it is there, is not especially useful in most use cases. Instead, you'd want to do something like run until complete. Um, so, you know, we have our AsyncQ 3. Uh, most of it is the same. The only difference, uh, or the only difference is, is that now the counter only counts until it gets to a million. So we want the counter to a million, or to get to a million. And we have the same task as always, but we run until complete task one. Now you may be wondering if task two will actually ever run at all. And the answer to that is yes, it is still a task that is assigned to the loop. We are just saying that we should run the loop essentially forever until task one is complete. So task two, which is the monitor, never actually finishes. We want to run, you know, all the tasks. We want to run everything we can until task one is complete. In this case, until the counter reaches a million. So in our case, that's the wrong one, actually. Uh, in our case, we could do async three. It does exactly the same thing as it did before. It prints the time, it prints the counter. However, so the moment it gets to a million, it actually cuts out. And you can probably actually print um, time dot time here and it will print the time in which uh, the counter was completed. I think that should work. Yeah, there we go. So you can see the time in which it completed. And then obviously you could do some stuff at the end to to to, uh, to show how long it took and whatever if you want to do all that. I'm not going to bother with all that because again, this is another simple example. But you generally have a run until complete rather than a run forever. Uh, in most instances. Sometimes it is more useful, but a lot of the times it generally, you know, you want to use the run until complete. So now that we've seen that two async methods can run together, uh, we can now do a more complicated example. So essentially what this is doing is it creates a loop down here, it creates a task main, and then runs um, until main is complete. However, inside main we actually have a second loop, which is something that you can do. And in this loop, we have all these different tasks. We have four tasks that all count up until 100, and they print, you know, their name and their um, and their index, and they uh, and they pass the work to other tasks the moment they've printed a single number, and that's very important. So while um, you know, and we have the running variable as well. So while running, you know, we set the running equals false, uh, just kind of as a little bit of a flag for task and task. If not task dot done. So a task can actually tell if it's done or not. Um, so all these tasks are going to complete at pretty much the same time. Although we could use random.randint to you know, do it differently. I might do that at the end of this uh, just for a little bit of experiment. But we can actually run the task. So this is the task object. So we don't need to call it or anything. We are just awaiting the coroutine. And then obviously, you know, something is still happening. So we set the running equals true. So this, so this while loop doesn't kill. And then if they're all done, the running will... Uh, never be set to true, so it'll all exit. And what you get with this is if I bring this up a little bit more, uh, you'll see that each task kind of takes their turn to print a number. So you have alpha 92, beta 92, delta 92, uh, gamma 92, and then you have alpha 93, beta 93, delta 93, etc., etc., all the way up until 99. However, if you were to get rid of our async.sleep0 and allow every task to run until it's complete, you'll see that the gamma has to wait until the delta task is complete, which in turn has to wait until the beta task is complete, which in turn has to wait until the alpha task is complete, because each task is a bit more selfish and wants all the time to itself, and it never actually you know, passes the CPU away or kind of allows the other tasks to actually do any of their work. So if we add this, each task is a lot more forgiving of the other tasks and it allows another task to take the priority while it's all happening. So it happens pretty much all in the same amount of time. They just, the operations happen in a different order, um, which is not always useful, but it can be, uh, um, especially if you're doing stuff that works with the internet. Now we are gonna, um, Oh, if we do uh, from random import random, I do want to do this experiment now that I've kind of had this idea. <laughs> um, so we do rand int, you know, say 50 or 150. 
And uh, we'll see how this works. So most of them actually really didn't bother <laughs> with doing different numbers at all. Yeah, they all kind of stopped. Well, the alpha yeah went way further. The gamma stopped at 88. The alpha was then allowed to go further. And you have, you know, the delta and the, and the beta all here. So this kind of, you know, simulates toss ending at specific times. And then obviously after, you know, all the other tasks have ended, the alpha is just kind of allowed to do its thing. Um, even though we have the await async sleep, there are no other tasks to pass, you know, the CPU to. So it just keeps it and it just runs everything until the end. I'm kind of amazed. <laughs> the only one up until 98, that's kind of weird. There you are. So that is basically a very simple rundown of async IO, async just in general as well. Um, there is a lot to it, and this is sort of as much as you would need to understand really to be able to use a library with an event loop already there um, and being able to sort of control when stuff gets passed to different uh, tasks or when control gets passed to different tasks, all that stuff. If you're developing with async IO, async IO, damn it. Um, I almost got there. You will probably need to know more advanced stuff. Uh, I do, I will link a resource down in the description that kind of goes into a lot more detail than this video does. I didn't want to spend huge amounts of time on this because I wanted this to be in the intermediate section, not the advanced section. But if you want to know the, the, the back end of how everything all works, then I recommend going and looking at that because that's actually a really nice little resource. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about with async stuff. If you have any questions, then feel free to leave them in the comments below, or you can join the Discord server using the link in the description. With that, I would like to thank my amazing patrons on screen now. One pound a month, and you can be on that screen too. And I will see you next time, where we... It will probably be uh, going back to the Pi Game series in the next video, to be honest. So I'll see you for that.